making our descent, approaching Alleman Air Force Base in Oklahoma. It is exactly 9.26. Isn't that a beautiful scenery, hun? Yeah. We're supposed to be landing in about five minutes. What happened is uh, we um, just finished eating breakfast. We had two sausages, scrambled eggs, two pigs with uh, some type of jelly sauce in it. Very nice. Glass of orange juice. It's real nice. All of the people are very nice. And I hope that you enjoy this beautiful visual sight. Look at that as we broaden the horizon here. Check it out. Isn't that beautiful? Gosh. And as you can see, we're getting lower and lower and lower. Superb. Jim Hudson, you are a superb photographer. Superb, indeed. And now you can begin to see the cars even moving along the ground down there, the highways. See the uh, wings on the rear of the plane as we sit. Isn't that beautiful? since Vietnam, since I came home from the military service last time. Here we go. Yes. Forgive me uh, for the tilting of the camera here. Beautiful. Go. Tuck down. Isn't that beautiful? Boom. Feel that, huh? the taxi. Yeah, Tinker Air Force Base, Oklahoma. Well, we even have a military honor guard, hon. A military honor guard for us. Can you believe that? <laughs> Here we go, huh? Saluting. See that? And that's something. Sports update on the Cubs. Look at that. Isn't that beautiful? United States Air Force Military. Welcoming committee. Well, here we are, huh? We're deplaning.
team room, the conference room of the um, U.S. Air Force Logistics Command here. And um, we're about to be briefed on various things. As you can see, you can see some of the distinguished visitors, guests. We've just deplaned, as you can see, and we're entering the auditorium. E.D. Beatum, E.D. Beatum, the company president. Regular? Okay. We are pleased that you could join us here and start your tour at a place that's a very vital cog in the support of the United States Air Force. And we want to run through a few graphs. This will also show you uh, some of the uh, ways that we have in getting information out to the various visitors that we have. Even some of our own military people who come in here for conferences as we're working the support programs uh, for the various airplanes and uh, engines we support around the world. We are uh, a combat organization. Uh, we're a very vital part of the team. One of the themes that we do in the military is to uh, not say that uh, the pilots themselves and the air crew members are really the tip of the spear and they're the top dog that make things happen. We most certainly have uh, appreciated over the years the importance of the maintenance role, the supply role, and the various support roles in getting the job done. It's, it's really a teamwork type operation. Here at uh, Oklahoma City, we are a very high-tech organization. You will see as you take some tours in about 30 to 35 minutes uh, what we're doing in the jet engine repair and the kinds of sophisticated equipment that we use in the repair and how we go about the job. We hire lots of engineers who do the analysis and the evaluation and the prediction of when we need to do a maintenance action, when uh, parts and so forth are going to fail. And uh, we here at a place like Oklahoma City make the decisions on whether airplanes will fly or whether they will be grounded until we get a certain maintenance action completed. So I hope you will get an appreciation for the kinds of technologies that your tax dollar we're spending here in order to get the job done. But we most certainly are a vital cog in the combat organizations of the United States Air Force. Our uh, major command, my bosses and so forth, uh, are located at Wright-Patterson Air Force Base, Dayton, Ohio. And our command is Air Force Logistics Command and logistics being a uh, conglomerate uh, term for the maintenance and supply and transportation, warehousing and procurement actions. And I'll tell you a little bit about each one of those major functions uh, during the course of our discussion this morning. But uh, here at Oklahoma City Air Logistics Center, uh, many of you uh, remember seeing patches and so forth of the the famous 8th Air Force and 15th Air Force in World War II. And all of these patches and symbols uh, have the yellow Air Force wings. And then there are certain uh, symbols in the center of that. And I would just ask you to look and imagine there's a gear and a cog that surrounds that star, and that represents the logistics business. Nothing happens unless our business turns so that airplanes and engines and parts missiles and so forth will work. It's a very uh, neat symbol that describes what we do. There are uh, five major uh, depots. We call them air logistics centers in the uh, United States Air Force. And today I will make sure that we don't use acronyms. I'll make sure that I describe <laughs> what things mean so that you will get some appreciation of what we're talking about today. But we have uh, a depot in the southeastern United States at Warner Robins Air Logistics Center near Macon, Georgia. And uh, they have a particular piece of the support action. They have their weapon systems that they're responsible from cradle to grave in the, in the logistics support. For example, they uh, manage 
the F-15 fighter, the C-141 uh, cargo airplane, and the C-130 airplane. They also have lots of maintenance actions dealing with the electronics, both the bombing navigation equipment as well as the jank. And which we'll see later in the day, and we run it there to verify that indeed everything we think we did do it, we did right. We've got a, a large amount of material in this building. Uh, you can see this vertical section have lots of commonality. And you can see that we have these engines in uh, various states of components out there. These engines are still new. They're still uh, very reliable. And so we're overhauling very few of these at the present time. We're right now concentrating on our primary efforts of correcting all of the repair technical data in training our people and uh, within about another three to four years it will be my opinion that this whole area that we're there's another one delivering right there these are some shops that you see along the left uh, horizontal type milling machines and one thing or another to to work that problem wow. i told you of trying to restore what those happens is is that when you have old airplanes uh take for example like the b-52 is a 25 year old airplane things wear out in it, it's difficult to find, if not impossible, replacement parts, so you end up having to resort to large multi-axis, what I refer to as a multi-axis milling machine, the ones like you see in the doorway, and you can see one there. We have eight types and models of engines that uh, we work here, and this is one of them. The shop is divided into three pieces, which I'll show you in just a moment. The first section is the rotor shop, and as the name would imply, it's where we build up the rotating, the rotors. Uh, rotating parts of the engines or the rotors. We we'll have a uh, second section, which is the sub assembly, where we build up the major cases, some of which you've seen as you're looking at our repair process. And then subsequently, we marry those together into a complete engine. What we like to do, even though it's a large group, we'll walk through the shop, and uh, I'll try and describe that in a little more detail as we go. So then you have the rejection, you have to take it out. Now, one of the, one of the things that we have to do is We're in the warehouse, by the way, of the place that repairs the engines, overhauls. This is the engine for one of the one of the most advanced fighters in the country. It's called an F-16. This is the engine for that F-16 fighter. that's used to conduct aerial refueling. It's called Program Depot Maintenance. 
It's a prescribed event. It has to take place every 48 months on Main that you see. Will there be, by the way, a Piper Cup or anything like that? Uh, small privately owned airplanes, or those you may have one, you know that the FAA requires a periodic inspection of the airplane. What you see here is a complex version of that. Now this area over here to the right is more of the same. These are 135s. The only difference is, is that's a moving line, if you will. We bring the airplanes in at the south end of the building there, that door way down at the far end. And the aircraft then hopscotch, if you will, or move. They stay on each one of these dock stations for... This is our escort. There's also an escort in front, in front of the bus. We're crossing the runway, about to depart for lunch, uh, where the building is. But as you can see, that's the, the building there is a mile long, and we just toured that whole building. The length of it is a mile, and we saw all sorts of fascinating things such as engines, planes, and so So it's actually running right now, right? The engine's actually running. We look at an engine that has about uh, 25,000 pounds of uh, mm -hmm. thrust forward. That's not the same one we're looking at. When I get the mag safe, no. Well, yeah, this is it, isn't it? I'll tell you what it is to Once it cranks on, yeah, you'll be able to see it now in a minute when he gets up to the AB portion. I got you pointing at the front instead of the back here. Most of you know how much noise a jet engine makes, so the acoustics in this building is pretty good. You can't hardly hear it running when you're in the control room. It's a little louder outside, however, and cause premature cracking. 
This particular engine has five stages of afterburner on it, which uh, the burner does, of course, it reignites uh, the vapors being expelled from the general engine and uh, creates some additional thrust from that. Feeds a little more fuel into the exhaust vapors, reignites it, and then uh, it provides the additional thrust. Composite material. Wow. Many of the new engines do. This engine has quite a bit of titanium. It's got a lot of uh, steel, a lot of high cobalt steel. Yeah. yeah, you can see the engine now going into afterburner. You can uh, see the fire being expelled. You see a cheering step up here. Uh, you know, you may be able to stay in That far enough? <laughs> This is the paint hanger, Nancy, where they paint all of the aircraft. You would just, uh, just come right on in, please, and gather out over this spot. This is, uh, this is one half of the paint facility that you're in. There's another dock on the other side that's the same size as this for all practical purposes. And uh, I'm going to let Mr. Charles Campbell here, the supervisor of this particular facility, say a few words to you. Uh, the Chicago Civic Leader for the supervisor. And this facility that you're standing in, we have about 300 people that work in here on a 24-hour day shift, six days a week. We work around the clock. To give you a little bit of an idea of what we do in this facility, And also, this is the owner, this gentleman is the owner of the Billy Goat, Nancy, and he, he wants a copy. Would you tell us what your name is and what you do? My name is Sam Sian, I'm the Billy Goat. Very good. He owns the Billy Goat, a very famous restaurant in Chicago, Nancy. That a boy. Okay. And this is the B-52, B-51 bomber, or B-1 bomber? Some of the finished products we have. We have uh, several airplanes that are almost ready or have just come back from a flight test. And uh, generally speaking, the first uh, flight test, uh, the airplanes are ready to be delivered. Once in a while, we'll have uh, maybe a rigging problem in the autopilot flight controls. you have to refly. But generally speaking, uh, flight out of uh, all of this after the rework and uh, the painting. But most of all, I want you to see how the paint styles have changed over the years from uh, silvery, silvery planes to uh, now we have camouflage. The reason you need the camouflage uh, airplanes is that uh, bombers go into enemy territory at low level, just a few hundred feet off the ground and uh, sort of hug the terrain. Enemy fighters are above and they look down, and we want to make sure the airplanes blend in with the trees and soil and, and so forth. Get, get in there now. General, would you please tell, tell them what your name is, sir? My name is Major General William P. Bowden, Oklahoma City Air Logistics Center, and we're standing before a B-52 that's undergoing extensive depot overhaul. It will be like new when we finish it. Over. Thank you, Jeff. <laughs> Can I, can I get a picture with you, General? Can I get a picture with you? Do you know how to do this? Right here. Just press that button. Right. You see the green light. You know it's working. Here, hold on. Hold on. Okay. And that's a zoom in and out there. A zoom in and out. Right on up. Thank you. Get your copy All right. You got it. Thank you. Good. Right. Let, let me run one for you. Oh, thank you. Pick it up, take it
Top of the B-52, sanding it down, repainting it, um, doing whatever other maintenance work needs to be done. That's up there on the top of the right wing, man. Isn't that neat? Superb. I mean, I've seen these things before, but never this close. Never. See this to believe it. Hey Sharon? Yes. How about inside it? the cockpit of a B-52 bomber? I'm gonna help this lady up there. Go ahead. You right? Ah. You really are in the cockpit. You really are in here. One seat for the co-pilot, one for the pilot. Look at that. Yeah? Unbelievable. Even a gas pedal. <laughs> a wall thing. A gas pedal. The throttle. Just like a car, you know. That's that's the throttle. Sure. As we take off, right? Yeah. I hope you can fly this. How about let's say four times three, six twenty-four dials? Twenty-four. Twenty-four dials. We've got a multiple. And don't forget the ones above you. Oh Lord, what about all the buttons over here that I'm hiding and all the dials and buttons? Do you have a license to fly the steering, the steering hey, wheel? Sharon, stand and put your head off the hole up there. Right, maybe someone take your picture. Hey, this is... My longest flight is 17 hours. We could, we could carry two pilots. Yeah. Keep going. In peacetime, the Air Force won't let me fly longer than 17 hours. There's nothing that important. They don't want me to get tired and take one of these 17 suckers 17 is a long time. Hey, I guess it'd be a long time. Yeah, you, no. you, you, you get good at, at slowing down the brain waves and yeah, trying to make yeah. the hours go fast. Crossword puzzles you get into, because I can just put them right here and do crossword puzzles all day. Uh -huh. uh, our complement is pilot, co-pilot, a flight engineer, and a navigator. Okay. Uh, flight engineer's got all the hard mental gymnastics stuff. He's got eight generators he keeps track of, okay? He's got seven fuel tanks he keeps track of. All the air conditioning and pressurization for the back, and they're always wanted to be hotter or colder in each of these zones, okay? And so he's playing with those all day. Uh, the cooling, those panels back there are for cooling all their electronic equipment. Uh, all right, gang, if I could get you to shift now, we got okay. the next one. You know, you've got some military jars on my note. But uh, clearly, when we pass a certain boundary, we uh, live all under the command relationship of the yeah. United States. We want to know our, our airplane operating instructions. We really are still in the mind control of the pretty static. It's really an intelligence operation. You can feel it. 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 
that's an F-16 over here on that far mm -hmm. little bit mm -hmm. site area where uh, the fighters are going up and sight up their guns. Yeah, it was like, kind of like a target. Yeah. Yeah. That's an F-16. Well, they'll This is an F4. These are going to be replaced here. This is a guard unit, a state operated guard unit. They're going to be replaced by an F16. In fact, there is an F16 over there. Right. Right there? Yes. Right over there. Yeah. This F16 that you're going to see where the lights are black, look at that view. John Russell. I've been here approximately 10 years and know a little bit about our particular operation. I'm going to welcome you here on this very windy day. You may be used to it, and by the time you get home, I can assure you that some of this wind will have gotten all the way to Chicago and welcome you back. It's probably going to be a little bit colder at that time. We are a member of the Reserve Forces. Weekends, but we do have one main drill weekend, which occurs each month. And egress. We'd like to break you into separate groups, if we could, uh, so that you can, in fact, uh, ask any questions you may have of any of these gentlemen. I think egress has another room that they'd like to take you into. And we have provided two stands here by the aircraft. I'll try and hover in this area. So I'll take a group over here and tell you a little bit about what I do. I want to get up in here to the aircraft first. We'll get a few people here before I get going, I guess. Get all the way up. Uh, I guess I'll better get started. This is, uh, I work directly with the pilot. And what we do here is we fit, we build, and we maintain all the equipment that they need to fly with, depending on the areas. It's what you use. This is what they call an anti exposure suit. You'll notice it's kind of a rubbery material. Well, what it's for is anytime they go overseas and the water temperature is 50 degrees or less, they have to put on this liner here, which will absorb the sweat. Then they will put on this. Uh, exposure suit, then they will put on their regular flight suit, their boots, and then they can go ahead and fly over the water. And what this is for, it's going to give them an extra 10 minutes if they have to eject into the water to get into their one-man life raft, and that's all this is for, and most of the time it's just when they fly over the northern Atlantic. This is their regular flight helmets, and everybody up there has, of course, everybody has different shaped heads, so we put this little contraption on top of their head, and then we pour a chemical in there and, and it comes out like a little hat. And we cut it, we put foam on it, we leather it, and then that way it's exactly fitted to their particular head. And we have four different sizes of mask and then we build up the mask, we fit it to them if they have any problems with it. You can see the microphone inside there. The ear cups are here and any problems that they have with the helmet or mask, we of course have to troubleshoot and find it. 
this is the harness that they wear when they step into the seat of the aircraft and sit down. Oh, I'm sorry. And what this is, is if they have to punch out of the aircraft, you'll see these releases right here. And they hook into the aircraft. If you notice up here on the airplane, see the little green thing back up in the seat, back up there? That is the parachute container itself, and it's got straps on it, and they hook it into here. Then when they put this on, they wear it just like they would a coat, and then they'll strap this around their leg, and if they have to punch out of the airplane, well, this is their seat, folks, right here. And they'll ride with this until they get down to the ground. They also wear what they call a G-suit. As we know, these air fighter aircraft pull a lot of Gs. And what this does, when they pull Gs, it, it takes the blood from their upper torso and it moves it down to their feet. Well, the aircraft is equipped automatically. When it starts pulling these Gs, it will inflate this G-suit, as we call it, and push the air, or excuse me, the blood back up to their head. And they'll wear it like this. They put it on here. And this is fitted to a particular crew member who is a lot smaller than I. And then they also have it here, and they zip it down the side so they have a bladder here, a bladder here, and a bladder here. So when they pull their G-forces, it pushes the blood back up. And of course, they can fly their mission, pull out of their uh, dive bombing yeah. toss, and things like that. Yeah. Pardon me? Yeah. Right. Well, what it does is it'll inflate it, and then when they're done pulling their G, it'll deflate it oh, all. Oh, So they don't even have to worry about that. And we also were getting into the chemical warfare stuff real heavy here, too. And you'll notice that this helmet is the same as this one, but what we do here, they can also wear their regular flight helmet with the chemical warfare mask. And the guys really don't, don't like to fly with it very well because they have to have filtered air, which is filtered through this filter. And they'll put this on, and I'm not going to do that. And we get an airtight seal on their face, and this clips into this harness right here so they can clip it onto this little bracket right here so it's out of the way. They clip mm -hmm. it onto there. And then what they do is plug into the aircraft system. And then they hook up to the aircraft oxygen through this little thing right here. They pop this mm -hmm. off. The hose comes up. So they're getting aircraft oxygen filtered and coming up in here where no uh, chemicals can get at them at all. Then also we take care of survival vests. Uh, in the vest you have a radio, flares, just all the survival items that they'll need if in fact they punch out. And different states like Oklahoma. This is some of the armament. Missiles. Surface to air, air to air. Beautiful, huh? They send out a signal at home and it works in conjunction with the radar signal of the aircraft to get an effective missile. Those must be the new ones over there. This is all, 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 all yeah. the Yeah. Boy, isn't this a beauty, though? It's gorgeous, huh? You know what they do? They sell them. Huh? They sell those. Yeah. They sell them to uh, friendlies. Allied forces. Yeah, heavy that bomb looks, huh? This this is a clip, Nancy, that they use to hold the bombs on until they want to release their load. You see them in the war movies that you and I watch all the time. Well, this is what it looks like up close and in li real life. Hmm? Pretty. Have to walk into an F-16. Watch as we go. Here we go. Up the stairs. Up the stairs. One, two, three. <laughs> I 
Assistant to Major General, Commanding General of this base. Two stars, see him? Real live, honest to goodness, all American, red blooded John. She loves it. It's, a, love it's it like a little red Corvette, hon. Huh? It's in the Oh, no. Before I claim out. She's about to take off on. I'm about to take off, okay. <laughs> with her armament. With, with or without? <laughs> Can you imagine ejecting at us? <laughs> It didn't flash again. You know? All right. There we are. I got gotcha. you. Banzai. Hey, Davey, don't you wish you were in one of these F-16s? Uh, not me. <laughs> <laughs> I forgot my G-suit. Just imagine that. Yeah. Yeah, you're real good on this one. Oh, yeah. Real good. Yeah. yeah I even job. zoomed in for you. Okay. Okay. Thank you. Uh, yeah. Again. And I mean, he looks good, doesn't he? Sitting in there, taking off. I'm ready to take off. Ladies and gentlemen, we are in a, he is sitting in a F-16 fighter bomber. USA. Are you coming along? <laughs> yes, sir. That's okay. Have you dropped your load yet? Yeah, I'm ready to go. <laughs> He's dropping the load. There he goes. All right. Did you get your room key? Uh, no, I didn't. Jim Hobson. Mr. Hobson. Yeah, I saw you on the Chicago Sun Times. Oh, okay. Thing. Yeah. What is what is the what is the model number on that plane? General, what's the model number of that plane right there? Okay, that's an F-4 oh, aircraft, okay. and uh, it's a two-seated airplane. It has a pilot in the front seat, and it has a navigator bombardier in the second seat, and uh, they do a whale of a job out here. Thank you, General. <laughs> you heard it straight from the horse's mouth, huh? Oh, yeah. An F-4 fighter bomber. Out of him from the free throw line. Now they put the pressure on. Simon Byron Wilson looking over the situation. Nice lead pass. They get it across. Garfield Park. Clarence Jackson sticking a knee out. First foul. Lester Rivers not happy with the call and not happy with just the way the game has been going. I'm sure they didn't expect to come out and really play like they have. I'm yeah. sure he expected to play a lot better and didn't expect the fire, the firepower of Garfield Park, which they continue. Morris Fuller hits his eighth point. Lewis up court. Montgomery underneath, and a foul is going to be called on Parrish Edwards. That's his third. This Garfield ball club looks like it'll hold its own with any high school ball club. I think so. Both of these teams, really. I think it's just Anderson is just having an off time so far. Oh, I'm sure you're right. I mean, if things were going right for Anderson, there's no doubt about it. Both are nice ball clubs. It's just that Anderson isn't getting on court. The F-16 
foul on Thomas Bird, his third. And in the ball game is Donnell Ryan to take his spot, as well as number nine, Eric Jenkins. Jenkins came in, scored five points, did a really good job. Their subs have been very good for, uh, for Garfield Park. that are supposed to be getting it done for Anderson aren't putting it in there. Jackson, Alex. Missed them both. Looking around, trying to find someone. He's got his man. And they'll work it around. Man-to-man -man defense. This is the first time we've seen this for. Oh. Good air collision. Anderson went to a man-to-man -man for the first time in the game. Jeremy Lewis, not enough, but nice tip in there by number 22, Clarence Jackson. Clarence Jackson, excuse me. 48-25 with 4.23 left in the third quarter. Jackson, his first foul, or second foul, excuse me. And we are now in the bonus. With 408 left in the third quarter, it's going to be a long haul. Nope. It is going to be a one-on-one, -on -one. yes. Referee's got it all straight.
Good job. 